Uh, again, I must apologize. I don't have a presentation. And uh, uh, Dinesh was kind enough to urge me to just consider uh, commenting uh, on the previous presentation. So I'm thinking on my feet. So you must forgive me if I you know, uh, am a little uh, sort of disorganized in what I say. Uh, and I won't test your patience either. I know it's going to be six. Uh, very quickly, I, let me start with an observation. When I walked in, this is the first time I've come to the conference room in, uh, in Nistad's. I was quite pleasantly surprised to see a large uh, statue of uh, uh, Buddha. And as I, I, I was thinking, OK, at least I'm going to come near something that looks appealing. But as I got very close, I saw on, on his very serene and enlightened face, this thing that said registration. You know? So it was very innovative in some ways. And I was thinking, you know, uh, in a certain way, uh, this way of innovating uh, is a way of also recognizing the point of history. And the fact that you don't really innovate, innovate uh, in a vacuum, right? You draw upon uh, local resources, you draw upon uh, histories, you draw upon cultures, and then you add on uh, something that gives a different spin. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, Buddha also reminded me of another, uh, another, uh, another book that I'm just beginning to read again, and that is uh, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. Uh, uh, in, in fact, there's a whole section there on Buddhism, Buddhist economics. And uh, uh, Schumacher makes two very crucial points in that essay, uh, which might be of some import uh, here. First, he argues that <clears throat> uh, he makes a distinction between renewable and non-renewable. Not very original for our times, but in his time, in the 70s, it was an original point to make that actually uh, non-renewable is actually the capital, and the renewable is the income, the surplus. So if you at all want to uh, you know, harness natural resources, renewable is actually living on income and not on the capital, which then depletes. But the second point, which I find is far more important and striking, is the point he makes about uh, locality and local resources. And he urges us to consider that as the scale. Uh, it's important as a scale because I think uh, Schumacher, when he's writing this, it, it got published in 73, but he wrote it in German, I think, in the 60s, late 60s. He was basically trying to respond to the, uh, the kind of intellectual paradigm that the post-Second World War world had been constituted of nation building, of uh, development in a very narrow sense, and all underpinned by the idea of progress. And I think Schumacher is one of the first amongst many subsequent to him who have been actually trying to unravel the idea of progress. Though I can, of course, think of George Sorrell's wonderful book called The Illusions of Progress, written somewhere in the 1920s, in which he argued that we should worry about this term because it's very homogenous, it's very reductionist, and it tries to suggest that all of us have one common destiny and not multifaceted. Anyway, Christopher Lash, Lash in a recent book, I think 80s, he actually provides a very comprehensive discussion on the idea of progress. And I was very, very pleasantly surprised to also read the manifesto uh, of the uh, STEP Center, which actually identifies this as a problem area, the idea of progress. And so they argue that we have multiple pathways that we can access and uh, perhaps take. But most importantly, instead of progress, we have what uh, Guttari and uh, Deleuze would call the idea of the rhizome, that we actually look at it more dendritically, that things can move in different fashions and different ways rather than in one linear uh, direction. And this manifesto centers two things very crucially. One is the idea of politics now becomes imperative to the way we organize science and technology. So science and technology is no longer simply something neutral that was long for long held, especially uh, the 1950s and uh, 60s notions of development and progress. And, se and secondly, I think they underline in a strange way, uh, but interesting way as well, the idea of uh, locality and the environment. And so now, if we are to move outside the idea of the nation, sorry, I said centrally politics, and the second thing uh, I meant to suggest is that they unsettle this notion of the nation as the basic scale of organizing science and technology. We have now, if we are thinking about the environment, we have to get outside the mindset of heroic technologies, such as um, nuclear uh, or big thermal plants, or uh, the way in which the scale is organized about nation building. 
Instead of that, we can and should perhaps rethink uh, sustainability at more local levels, at uh, perhaps network levels that uh, Raghunandan had pointed out to, and you know, begin to play with geography and scale and time in very interesting ways than what was uh, what science and technology seemed to have been committed to in the 50s and 60s. And so I'll end with that, but I'd also uh, urge you to consider one thing, and though I enjoyed all the presentations, I've learned a lot, I sometimes worry if we don't simply argue that people are passive, that you know we are a kind of uh, laity or a, a priesthood that goes out there and then gives them things, makes their lives wonderful, and then enables them to be empowered. I think we also have to be attentive to the understanding of what a dialogue means. That is, we also learn from them as much as they uh, learn what uh, we think we can commit to them. So in all the presentations, I must say there was, uh, there was not enough of an emphasis on the idea of a dialogue. And that is very crucial to the way I think we unravel, uh, what shall we say, post-progress science and technology. Yeah? Uh, and if we really want to make it something that uh, addresses the challenges of our time, then it will have to be a dialogue. Because I don't think, uh, like Buddha, you know, people, uh, I mean, like that Buddha statue there, it comes with the history, it comes with the culture, it comes with the sense of what uh, it's committed to and what it means. Yeah? So I think in a large number of efforts that we might take, uh, attempt to pursue and, and challenge this heroic notion of technology, we'll have to learn to also have a dialogue and be able to listen to people. And I, I, I'm not saying that I've done it. Uh, I also belong to an institution. Uh, and I often joke with my students that, you know, let's accept and, <clears throat> and recognize the fact that we uh, produce privileged knowledge. It's only one type of knowledge amongst a wide spectrum of possible ways of thinking. Yeah? Uh, and we must recognize that not only to humble ourselves, but also to learn and to know to realize the fact that we can go out there and learn uh, more yeah so on that note uh, dinesh i don't know if i've done you any disservice i'm totally unprepared i didn't come with a presentation yeah uh, yeah uh, and uh, you know it's a few thoughts uh, you know done standing on my feet and uh, i hope uh, i've earned my lunch thank you Good job.